Oh, I want to thank CCI Action and all of you for coming out here today. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of energy in this room, yes? Yeah. Well, good. It's uh, my great honor to be here with all of you and to talk about the story that we share together, the story of us, the story of all of us together. Uh, my name is Martin O'Malley. I come from Maryland. I'm the former mayor of Baltimore, the former governor of Maryland. Baltimore in the house? Yeah? All right, man. And I've, I've, I, in the opening remarks are what, like five to seven minutes just sort of framing things? Four. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so now we only have three more minutes to go. Um, look, I, I think the, uh, the genius of our nation is that in every generation we take actions to include more of our people more fully in the economic, the social, and the political life of our nation. That's what makes this the land of opportunity. That's what allows us to be able to give our children a future that, that's more secure and, and more prosperous. My background, unlike my other two uh, fine colleagues who are running for your party's nomination, is not that of a senator or as a cabinet member, but as an executive, primarily. And I have been at the forefront of some of the toughest issues of face, facing justice and injustice and race in America I was mayor of Baltimore. I ran in 1999, not because our city was doing well, but because we had allowed ourselves to become the most violent and addicted city in America. And we were burying over 320, 340 young black men every year, and black lives matter. We weren't able to make our city immune to setbacks, but we were able to save a lot of lives cut violent crime by, the, by 40 percent, uh, biggest reduction in crime of any city in America over the next 10 years, reduced deaths from overdoses by 30 percent by increasing drug treatment. We doubled awards to uh, minority and women-owned businesses during that time in the city. And then as governor, I increased by 117 percent the award of city contracts to African-American-owned businesses. We defended all through the recession the highest median income in America and the second highest median income in America for African American families. So, and unlike Governor Branstad, rather than cutting public education, we increased it by 37 percent. And we're thereby able to address what it had been a, a really uh, awful inequity and disparity in the funding of public education in our state. We made our schools the number one public schools in America five years in a row, according to Education Week magazine. And we also increased funding during a recession to uh, uh, not only to higher education, uh, we went five years in a row, or rather four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition, and we increased funding for our HBCUs by some 37 percent as well in those years. So my, my politics, my economics, my actions have been the politics, the actions, and the economics of inclusion, including more people more fully in the success of our country. That's really what it's all about. And the great Marylander Frederick Douglass probably summed it up best when he said that we are one, our cause is one, and we must help each other if we are to succeed. That's the truth I'm calling forward in this presidential campaign, and that's why I believe Iowa is going to surprise people on caucus night by showing that in our country, the individual citizen is still the highest office in the land. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thank you, Governor. And we're going to begin our interactive portion of the forum today. And first, you'll hear a question from Terrell Williams from Baltimore, your home city. <laughs> There we go. I'll start again. 
What, we want to hear that voice, Terrell. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Terrell Williams. I'm a resident of Baltimore City. And I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, in a place called Cochrane Gardens, which com was comprised of five buildings, 25 stories high. And the elevator in my building never worked. It was so scary going through those stairwells trying to get to the 20th floor. I saw so many things in those stairwells. I saw uh, people rolling dice. I saw uh, fights. I saw bullying. I even saw women getting raped. A six-year-old should not have to see that. I, sometimes I would run three blocks down, and there was this beautiful four-story building. Beautiful flowers, nice shiny windows, and an elevator that worked. I'd stand out there and just watch people go in and come out. None of them looked like me. The school I attended looked much like the building that I lived in. Um, it looked like a prison. It had windows we could not see in or out of. The books were old. There was no lined paper. And from pre-K through high school, I did not experience one science lab. I said to myself, when I have kids, they will not be raised in a place where I was raised. They deserve more. So I worked hard, and, I've got, and I got a, a, what I think is a beautiful education. And I said, through those trials, I will dedicate my life to, make, to creating healthy communities for healthy families, and we're doing just that in Baltimore City. We are, we are working with community leaders, with churches, and with private investors bringing them together to leverage local, state, and federal funds to transform these distressed communities. We're also talking to CEOs of the top companies and saying to them, you must pay a living wage. <laughs> we also started this organization I call a movement called Turnaround Tuesday where our returning citizens come every Tuesday and we help them with every single thing we can to make sure that they get not only a second chance, but a third chance and a fourth chance, because we don't throw away people. We need to invest, make the kind of investments that uplift all of us together. Governor O'Malley, yes, <laughs> will you, I want to make sure I get this correct, what would you do nationally to invest in black and brown communities that have been historically discriminated against, and will you champion the necessary public investments that target those communities? Yes. I believe I'm the only candidate seeking uh, either party's nomination to put forward a new agenda for America's cities. It has not been since Jimmy Carter that we had a new agenda for America's cities. As I see it, and from my experience as mayor and my experience as governor, uh, there are three areas where the federal government could be hugely helpful in bringing opportunity and a higher standard of living to places in the centers of our metro economies that have been so far left behind by the recovery. Uh, what are those three? Number one, investments in mobility and transportation options. One of the... For seven years, I worked to modernize our, uh, our uh, 
transportation funding, our gas tax, so that we can invest in mass transit opportunities through some of those parts of Baltimore that uh, have been portrayed for decades uh, on television shows. And as soon as we got the funding, then I was succeeded by a Republican governor and he pulled the plug on it. But, need, uh, but needless to say, progress kind of zigs and zags, doesn't it? So uh, I, w I believe that the biggest, and studies show, and one of the biggest impediments to upward economic mobility is a lack of mobility itself. So we need to double our investments in transportation, including mass transit options in our cities. Secondly, secondly, uh, poor families are pay a larger percentage of their, uh, of their uh, uh, monthly living expenses going to housing, oftentimes substandard housing. We need to make a big investment, and I propose doubling our investment in workforce and affordable housing in our country. And related to those two, and uh, consistent with being the only candidate to put forward a plan to move us to a 100% clean electric grid by 2050, I believe that we need to uh, acknowledge the truth that, si that our city centers are places where unemployment is highest and also where our energy usage and wastage is highest. There is work to be done. There is retrofitting to be done. Uh, and there, we, in the early days of the Obama administration, uh, we saw what mayors could do when given these funds. So I believe that we should make cities the center, or rather the leading edge, of this movement to a clean, green, designed, built energy future with net zero homes, with buildings that produce more energy than they use. And I also believe that we need to double our investment in community development block grants so that mayors Mayors who know what needs to be done can do the demolition and the other things that get people back to work. Thank you, Governor. Next up, we're going to hear from Rod Adams from Minneapolis. Okay. All right. My name is Rod Adams. I'm from Minneapolis. I'm from Grab it. Just grab it. There you go. All right. All right. My name is Rod Adams. I'm from Minneapolis. And for the past six to seven years, I've struggled with bouts of long bouts of unemployment, and I've worked a variety of minimum wage jobs, doing all this to take care of me and my daughter. But through it all, I had hope. I had hope because I was a college student who was really close to graduating, knowing that once I graduated, I would be so much closer to achieving the elusive American dream. But once I graduated, I figured out that that American dream was just that, a dream. Sometimes I had to, sometimes I had to choose between eating food or paying my rent. In the wealthiest nation in the world, that ain't right. Okay, now the Federal Reserve has a mandate for full employment, but black communities, specifically in the Midwest, are struggling to find employment, and they haven't felt the effects of this mandate. In Minnesota, black Minnesotans, the rate of unemployment for black Minnesotans is almost four times as high as it is for white Minnesotans. The median income gap is $33,000. Okay, these disparities create an atmosphere of desperation. And once you combine this atmosphere of hopelessness and desperation with the archaic system of policing, what you've created is a ticking time bomb. These bombs have exploded in the form of uprisings in Ferg Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, and most recently back home in Minneapolis. All over, people of color have taken to the streets to say one thing, that our lives matter. Now, Governor, the Fed has played a direct role in the pain and suffering of these communities. By not fulfilling the mandate for full employment and not reinvesting resources into these communities, they have left people scrambling for hope, people who look just like me. What could the Federal Reserve do to fulfill this mandate, and what would you do through appointments to make sure that this is done? Thank you. Uh, in, in in all of the appointments that I would make, and in my history of 
being a mayor who had to assemble a cabinet and make appointments and a governor who assembled a cabinet, you will see a, a long, consistent track record of appointing people who uh, not only reflect the great strength of the diversity of our city, our state, our country, but also people who understand that we're all in this together, that share the same basic belief that we all do better, in Paul Wellstone's words, when we're all doing better. As um, in our state, we, for the first time ever, exceeded our goals for minority and women business uh, procurement goals. We had the highest goals in the land, and we exceeded them in a recession, and then we raised those goals. I mentioned before that we had the highest medium, second highest median income for African-American families. We passed a living wage, we raised a minimum wage. We made it easier for people to bargain collectively and for better wages. The, uh, I was reading on the way here, and I know you asked about the Federal Reserves. To the Federal Reserve, I would appoint people who understand that our economy is not money, it's people. It's all of our people. And therefore, we must, just like our parents and grandparents before us, take the actions that actually restore common sense wage and labor policies. No family that works hard for a living should have to wait, raise their children in poverty. So we used to keep the minimum wage above the poverty line all the time. I believe that we got away from that in the 1980s with trickle-down economic. It's time to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, however we can, wherever we can. We need to raise the threshold to always pay overtime pay for overtime work again in our country. Because the way our economy grows is not from the trickling down from the top, is it? Have you ever seen a stalk of corn grow from the tassel down? That's not the way it happens. The more our workers earn, the more our workers spend, the more our economy grows. That's called American capitalism when it's right. Thank you. Governor, next we'll hear from Reka Basu from the Des Moines Register. We have about a minute. Hi, Governor O'Malley. Good to see you again. Good Thanks to see for you being again. here to answer our questions today. Um, I'm going to shift gears for a minute and talk about foreign policy and ask you about a foreign policy issue. And this one um, is on a topic, a human rights situation that all too often goes ignored in our priorities, especially when we talk about the Middle East. And that is the fate of Palestinians who are living under Israeli occupation. clear that both Palestinians and Israelis have suffered from their fair share of violence. Yet with the Gaza blockade and military checkpoints and the destruction of farming and livelihoods and bombing campaigns, Palestinians are being forced to live as second-class citizens in their own land. Now, presidential candidates always pay tribute to our special relationship with Israel which, as you know, comes with $3 billion in military aid every year, without mentioning the plight of Palestinians. My question is, under an O'Malley administration, would that aid and friendship be unconditional? And if not, what steps would Israel be required to take toward honoring calls for a Palestinian homeland? I have visited the Middle East many times, and on a more recent visit, I visited not only and sat down with Mr. Netanyahu, but I also sat down with Mr. Fayyad in the Palestinian Authority. I am the only presidential candidate of either party to take the time to travel to Michigan about a couple months ago to address the American Arab Institute, and I was the first presidential candidate after Donald Trump's rather uh, uh, fascist remarks about American Muslims. <laughs> to go 
to be in solidarity with my American Muslim neighbors at a mosque in Northern Virginia to express my solidarity and the, and the better path forward for us as a nation. We are probably the only nation on the planet that has the ability to continue to call people back to a two-state solution. I believe very firmly that the, what is in the best security interest of the region, of Israel, and the United States is a two-state solution. And however elusive that may look, we need to have the hope as Americans to peer through the darkness and realize that a new day is always possible. I was very glad to have received the endorsement of Starpack, and I know that many of their members also share concern for uh, peace and, and dignity and respect for human rights in this very, very uh, uh, deep and long struggle. And to those who say that the time for a two-state solution has passed, I remember not too long ago, people used to say the same thing about Northern Ireland. Catholics and Protestants, nationalists and loyalists have been fighting each other for so long that there was no way you could heal that 700-year-old wound. But with an American peace envoy, with a commitment to American principles, we were able to create a process for peace. I believe that America is best in this world when we are waging peace, and that is true in what I believe must be our unrelenting commitment to uh, respect for human rights and the pursuit of a two-party, so a two-state solution and actions consistent and not inconsistent with laying the groundwork for that. Thank you, Governor.